a remarkable set of presentations uh, this afternoon. So at this point, we have the opportunity for questions and comments. And uh, I see a couple of us moving up to the microphone. Rima, are you headed that direction? I am. I am. That was fantastic. Now, with really no talent whatsoever, I wrote something rather quickly to honor our poets. It's a haiku. If you recall, five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables, with a twist. Health literacy. Why do we talk about them? What are we saying? There you go. Is there yeah, the, a, these guys workshop poems, so I don't know if you want to. Like <laughs> 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 yeah, what do they think? <laughs> Susan? Wait, 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 I'm looking at my question. Um, hi. Um, I was uh, just curious, you didn't talk a whole lot about um, the preparedness language, Linda, but I was, I was wondering about your thoughts on um, Thinking about the attribute that deals with high-risk high situations, when we've, when we in Nebraska have been sort of wrestling with the attributes, um, high risk to us. Um, one of the places where we thought that applied was in the preparedness language, um, and preparedness I think is kind of an interesting example because, um, by my estimation, until 9/11, there was, um, there maybe there were. 10 preparedness specific words, and then we have in the last decade developed an entire new vocabulary in public health that we now have to spend a lot of time trying to translate for ourselves. And so I think two questions. One would be, you know, what kinds of tools are out there around the preparedness language in general, but also how can we sort of going forward avoid creating a whole new language around our next major public health issue? <laughs> uh, it's a really good question. I'll just comment that at the beginning of working with people who are deaf and hard of hearing, and I would often be among one or two people who are hearing in a whole room of people who are not hearing and using a different language. And one of the first things we learned is that there aren't words in, for example, American Sign Language for the things that uh, those of us in this room would normally understand in terms of disasters. So developing glossaries was important. But I, I think with the direction of your point is that we can create whole new uh, languages of jargon. I mean, in medical school, people learn 18,000 new words or something, and then they go out and use those on the unsuspecting public. <laughs> so, you know, what we've been trying to do, we as a group, especially the people who are the intended users, have been trying to de-jargonize everything about risk, about disasters, because the overlay here on health literacy is risk communication. In a crisis situation, you're cognitive skills, your um, emotional stress can sometimes take over, and any of us have trouble um, understanding even kind of simple things. So uh, again, the answer is to have people develop the, their own information. And if they do that, it will work for them. Mm -hmm. But we, we certainly don't want to go down that track. Andrew? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, this is directed at Jennifer, but it's for any of the panelists. Um, part of the problem, uh, when you're talking about prevention activities, uh, there's a different paradigm or different construct of primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention in public health sector as there is in the clinical environment. Uh, and do you think this contributes to part of the confusion? I have to admit that because so much of my time is spent on uh, bringing together the clinical uh, sectors and, and, and clinical professionals from nutritionists to physicians and so on, and the population health approach, that I had never 
really thought about how, I'd really never thought about your question. If this is part of why people are confused about how do you prevent chronic disease before you even have it, before you even know, because we don't, we don't have information um, like we hope to have someday on you know, the biomarkers that are going to put each one of us at greater or lower risk of all of these chronic diseases, but just what are the universal precautions for preventing chronic disease? If there is a disconnect between um, what somebody might hear from a clinical one-on-one -on -one and then what they're hearing in the, the public health messaging that we're talking about so much today. And then does the same hold true for secondary prevention? If you already have, as Dean and the team were talking about, if you already have diabetes, how do you not have to be a person who has an amputation and then so many of the other, um, other issues? I guess I, I don't know. I'm, you, you've flummoxed me. Maybe somebody who's, <laughs> maybe, Dean, this might be well, a better I mean, question I, this, for you. This came, this came up a lot in our workshops with, with, with the uh, young people. Um, it's, I think, what you're basically asking is the difference between individual behavior change and, and community change. And, mm -hmm. Is that what you're asking? And, yes. You know, mm -hmm. uh, oh, your, your um, okay. what did you say, your biomarkers and your social and environmental context. And it's not so much a definitional issue. I think it's a conceptual framework on how you think the world works and mm -hmm. how, how you understand human biology and disease and health and, and uh, there is a lot of work that needs to get done. Maybe, maybe you guys could talk about that leap. And before I hand you the mic, I just want to say I really want to thank Lila for, for being willing to have this kind of out there presentation to the IOM. I told these guys this is like the Grammy Awards to, to present to the IOM. And George, for you letting us do poetry for the IOM. I mean, that's kind of cool. No, thank you guys for having us, sincerely. I mean, yeah, to Dean's point, uh, I've been a part of, the, part of the bigger picture since 2010, since it started. And um, I think a big thing was, you know, we're making short films. And we refer to them as PSAs because that's a colloquial term that people know. Mm -hmm. But let's think about PSAs. PSAs live in the binary of if you do this, this will happen to you, and that is bad. You know, if we, like the, the brain, on, the, the, the brain, the egg on the frying pan, talking about your brain on drugs, isn't nearly as effective as you know, talking about that framework, which is Dean, which Dean is talking about, which is like, you, we are individuals, but we are individuals as part of a larger commu local community and part of a larger world. And so the framework that was presented to us a bigger picture was just that. We as individuals have the agency to, to or to not buy a pack of Cheetos or a two liter bottle of Coke or whatever. But some of us live in food deserts or areas where access to an alternative option is not there, period. And that corner that I'm talking about is having both at the same time. I lived on a corner that had an organic grocery on one side and a McDonald's on the other. And I faced an individual decision every day, but my world that I was living in had both binaries, but also like if I went five blocks east, that world was completely different. So I mean, it's, it's kind of like looking at, we do have individual responsibility, but that individual responsibility is extremely affected by the environments in which we live and the policies that shape those environments. And I think learning about corn subsidies in the 1970s and how that contributed to the high fructose corn syrup, sugar sweetened beverages epidemic and how that increased type two diabetes, that is a direct legislative policy that directly altered the world in which we live and thus altered our individual choice within that world. So that framework needs to be nuanced. We need to live in the gray area in these decisions because that's what we live every day. It's not the binary of egg on a frying pan living on, that's what happens when you're on drugs. It's much more complex than that. You know, I mean, whether it's tap water, whether it's like the age in which we start looking at, you know, diabetes as pre-diabetes or whatever. I mean, like, there's a lot of different factors. It's not just one or the other, which I think is the framework for some of the PSAs that preceded us um, historically. Well stated, sir. <laughs> yep. So, uh, is that, are we over to Andrew? Okay, sure. Um, first, uh, 
Hi, Andrew Pleasant again, I know. Um, thanks everybody for demonstrating really clearly the vast range of approaches to addressing public health from a health literacy perspective. Um, and just to sound like a broken record, you know, none of these are in fact addressed adequately in the existing IOM volume. So it's just more evidence, <laughs> honestly, more evidence. All right, the word R, I will bet you, the word R as a form of intervention does not appear once. Um, and if it does, then it is once, maybe because of you, right? Um, but as someone who, uh, Jennifer and I, do a community-based theater intervention, um, and you all talked about health literacy as sort of a targeting behaviors, you know. For an artist, the world is free to, to uh, express the world just the way you want it and be very almost dogmatic about it sometimes because that's the power of being an artist. But we also know in health literacy, the power of creating change is engaging people in defining what the solution or the new world is supposed to look like. So I just, you guys are very mature and have done some excellent work. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on that, how you balance your view with how the community can change and just suggest if you haven't read this guy's work, then you need to look up Augusto Boal from Brazil, B-O-A-L. Um, I think you'll find his ideas about art and uh, social change really uh, enlightening. So. Yeah. Uh, I've heard of a lot. I've been meaning to check him out, so thank you. Um, I think one of the big things in terms of the school visits and what we do, um, you know, I think the big thing in terms of like solutions-based kind of art and activism is, you're right, like art can be extremely uh, dogmatic and can be very one-dimensional in terms of I feel this, you know, regardless of whatever statistics are put in front of me, this is my this is my statement to the world, which is amazing that they had liberty to do that. Um, but there was that kind of context in terms of the workshops of like, you know, we couldn't get too hyperbolic, nor could we, we couldn't write the, you know, F U fast food, insert fast food company here, poem. You know, we wanted to be effective. And, right, you know, we, we kind of go to the border and then we kind of push back a little bit, but it's to engage as many people as possible to let them know that this comes from a place of concern and not necessarily just rage, and which is how spoken word from our community is generally uh, stereotyped as. It's a soapbox and a beret and a finger snap. You know, it's not a short film. It's not engagement. It's not actual an analysis through prose, you know, so um, it's a big concern, but I think in terms of solutions, it's looking at the world that exists presently and why those things are flawed and kind of looking at the world 50 years ago and seeing why that world was different and kind of analyzing the change between past, present to discover that future. Yeah, yeah, we just put out a poem right now um, produced by this uh, separate filmmaker, Dimitri Moore, uh, called The Quantum Field. And The Quantum Field was written by a young man named Telejon Quinn, uh, a graduate of Met West High School in Oakland, which is in a food desert. Um, he's an 18-year-old, well, now 19-year-old poet. I thought he was like 16 for the first four months I met him, but he fooled me. Um, but it's basically a poem about a young man who works out, eats healthy, does all these things, but it's kind of in a twilight zone vein that he lives in this world called the quantum field where all that healthy living and all, that, all those attempts to live healthy are not appreciated. In this world, the quantum field that he lives in, you know, everything that's appreciated is fast food, is not working out, is dormant culture. And so it kind of through sci-fi kind of references and kind of adapting the Twilight Zone, we're able to literally visually invert the present world that we live in to show that here's this one man trying to make solutions in a, a parallel of the world that we live in today, and he's failing. So it's kind of looking at, there's a lot of folks, I think a lot of young people who are living green, that are eating healthy, that we encounter all the time, that don't want to drink cola, that don't want to do this stuff, but within the context of the larger environment, are kind of ostracized. I mean, if you're the group of kids going at lunch off campus to go buy a pack of Cheetos and you're not in that cool crew, you're gonna feel a bit ostracized. But if your community, if cool in your community is kale salad, then you're good, you know? But different, every school is different. And in the Bay, we have everything from the gourmet, the gourmet ghetto, literally, the neighborhood's called the gourmet ghetto, to the literal ghetto. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it runs the gamut. But I mean, those changes, again, happen block by block in the Bay, and I'm sure throughout the country as well. So let's uh, ask uh, Ruth for her question. Oh, I'm sorry. 
I was just going to briefly add that I think that during the workshop, something that um, we found to be really effective in terms of kind of shifting this conversation from an individual behavior responsibility, kind of blaming the, the victim scenario to really shifting the focus towards the environmental and, and the system systemic forces that affect chronic disease and affect um, diabetes risk and prevalence, was really just saying this isn't as much of a medical issue. This isn't just you need to eat better and exercise more, but much more, this is a social justice issue. So instead of let's not drink this soda or eat this food, and let's look at why there are less resources allocated for outdoor spaces in poor neighborhoods than in wealthy neighborhoods. Um, kind of thinking about the reasons why we make these individual choices, the, the driving forces behind why we make these individual choices changed as a result of Poets Workshop participation. We had one woman who was in the sugar sweetened beverage workshop, and she would come in with a big liter of Coke and sit in you know, and learn about um, industry tactics and how their minorities are being targeted by the sugar industry. And once she left the workshop, she completely unprompted on Twitter was like, I'm all about water now. I'm not drinking any more soda. And we never said, you should do this because it's better for you, but it's because she realized that she was being exploited. And that's much more motivating. And to so one more um, actually, let's yeah. make sure we get all our questions in sure. before you uh, continue. Yeah. Uh, Ruth? I certainly echo what everyone else said. Thank you all so much. Alice, I can't help but uh, think about the decade of work you've done and what you've done to really put oral health and oral health literacy on the map. And it's, it's just really an astounding story to look at where that started and where it is a decade later. And, you know, the work that you've done through all that you've really created there to, um, to really start an incredible movement with that. And I certainly, you know, applaud your efforts on that. I think you're a real champion. Thank you, but, but really there are a lot and, and working in um, health literacy now in oral health uh, throughout the country. It's really very positive. Uh, and I, I would really just add that I think what, what I heard from everyone is really the role of passion in really the work that's been done. I certainly uh, applaud the young artist and your great heart and what you're doing to give voice to art and to, to let it be a voice that, that can reflect what we're doing. But I really thank you for rejuvenating Dean. <laughs> <laughs> right up here. Yes, Terry Parnell from the North Shore LAJ Health System. Again, um, what everyone has said, it was this was just a fabulous panel. Um, I thank everybody very much for all of their work and effort. Um, the poetry and the videos, um, what a wonderful vehicle to combine that art and science of, uh, for health literacy. I mean. I think most of us in this room are very passionate about health literacy. This may be the very first time many of us were emotionally moved, you know, um, watching that and, and hearing that. So I thank you for that. And I think I see a documentary, you know, award-winning documentary in your future. So thank you. Okay, and Linda, you, uh, you had in your uh, presentation uh, the seven steps to uh, uh, for effective communication, I believe it was. And your seventh step had to do with scaling up. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna ask um, Dean and your team and um, Alice in particular uh, and Jennifer about uh, how do you take really brilliant programs like what we've seen here and make them something more than just one bright spot in this. Uh, so how do you do it? And we heard from earlier Nebraska. We heard from Arkansas. Uh, we heard from Louisiana. Uh, so how, how, how are we, uh, what's the plan for how um, we Well, scale may I them? say first Go ahead. that um, I want to make sure that we can make a difference clinically um, mm -hmm. because, you know, everybody's been throwing out all kinds of educational materials forever. Um, but um, our, our plan is to do a small focus group, not a focus group, a small uh, county, actually mm -hmm. in the county where Diamante Driver died. And our intent is to work through the county health department. And, and it'll take several years because that's how long we will enroll pregnant women, track that infant and the mom to see what their oral health is like at the end. And, depending on that outcome, and we'll make changes along the way, then I would see it could be statewide, 
uh, it could go to any state after that. Assuming it could it go to any state, but how will it go to any state? How is will my it question. go? Well, what is the plan? Well, uh, I'm I don't, still I don't have by, that plan yet. It, it yeah. will take money, but if you knew the billions of dollars that we spend for treating tooth decay that we don't have to because we know how mm -hmm. to prevent right. it, that I think that is going to be um, a, a good shot. I'm still struck by Andrew's map of all yeah. the white states mm -hmm. and all of non-responses to the, to the simple question. So I guess I want us to think a little bit about how we scale up and mm -hmm. how we spread yeah. the innovation. So Go ahead. With respect Steve. to our program, uh, our step one was present to the IOM. So we could check that box off. And since we've got a web that's right, going out right. there, we're helping me so with that. We're glad we, to do that. We believe that we have um, the the structure and the model. We also have um, the platforms because Youth Speaks has sister programs throughout the country in major urban areas, mostly urban areas, but not exclusively urban areas. Um, so what we really need is uh, a major underwriter to support both the implementation nationwide as well as the social media mm -hmm. and web presence. We have a approached the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, who were interested but said, we're kind of sick of giving money to programs that go away after we leave, so you need to have a sustainability plan. Yep. And when I asked, well, what is that? They basically said sponsorship. So who's going to sponsor? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the sugar sweetened beverage industry isn't going to sponsor this. Are you sure? So, I don't know. So we, I think the, the real question is, what is the financial model that would not make money, but you know, allow, allow it to spread. Maybe you can have I, the answer. Can I be a, a little bit of a, a, a provocative segue here? So my answer to your question, George, is, is partnerships. Mm -hmm. And in all of the work that Andrew and I get to do with our colleagues, um, it's all about developing partnerships with academic institutions, with other nonprofits, and with companies. So um, that would be our model for how we're taking something that may start off as a program that we do in a couple of shanty towns in Lima, Peru, or do in a very small town in one county in Massachusetts, but then expand it, and that's how you sustain it. Because in public health, as we know, if you haven't replicated something, if you haven't evaluated it, you haven't replicated it, you haven't sustained it, you really haven't done anything. You've just made a little noise. You've just made a little splash. So. One of the things that I really would encourage any of us to do to try to scale up and answer George's question here is look at the non-traditional partner. And it's not about saying, um, let's sell out. It's about saying, okay, so maybe there's a non-traditional partner. I mean, you think about it, um, they're still, uh, there's still a bias against even working with um, pharmaceutical companies. And yet, you know, I, I think earlier today somebody, and I can't remember who it was, was it, was it you, Linda, talking about working with a pharmaceutical company? And there's a little bit of a, like, you have to explain yourself. You have to, you know, it's a little bit of a, there's a little bit of defensiveness that's, that's, that's that. That's understandable. Well, is it? So is it? Is it really? So then that's, that's kind of the stuff that we each have to explore exactly. in ourselves is why is that a problem? If we, as public health practitioners, are doing things ethically, with, with true uh, following the guidelines, working um, in ways that we are receiving unrestricted educational grant funding, we're measuring everything, we're not um, you know, kowtowing to anybody. Why is it a problem to work with, as we do at Canyon Ranch Institute, to work with the Clorox company? Mm -hmm. They have a great deal of knowledge about household and personal hygiene that can save lives. That health literacy information is not getting to people through them, mm -hmm. but it can through us. So what's wrong with working with industry if you do it in a way with true ethical wisdom and following the best practices mm -hmm. of public health and health literacy? That can be a wonderful way, actually, for your team, your outstanding, incredible team here, to expand not only what you're doing in service for other communities, but also to learn from why is it that the moms and the dads and the, and, the, and the people who work for those companies, that maybe to you might seem a little other, 
they're still people. So what's going on and how can you influence their thinking a little bit? And that's, that's one of the ways that we believe you have to get to scale so, is by involving everybody. So Alice wants to get in here. Linda has a, a point, yeah. and I'm going to give the last word to the poets before okay. we go to break. Okay. I, so. I would just like to volunteer to be a partner, and this is why. Unusual partner. No, we've got some tooth decay stuff in wait, the poem. Wait, the art? <laughs> no, wait a minute, wait a minute. True. The arch criminal, the arch criminal uh, 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 is sucrose, sugars, yes. for both diabetes and cavities. And, and Obesity. Exactly. So we can work together. The, the more, the more you combine together, the more partners exactly. you have for one health issue, the, exactly. the better. Um, so I'm. So there you go. <laughs> We're already building a coalition right here on the panel. <laughs> Linda. Uh, two comments. First of all, I really love this creative partnership idea, and uh, we can ask our young artists here too, thinking with an entirely different mindset. If they had, where would they go for cash? And one of the places to go for cash is to Silicon Valley and other places where they're extraordinarily rich people, often very young. They, what they want is to make a difference. Exactly. If, you, if you look at what Alice is talking about or anybody here, um, with just a little bit of money, you can have a huge impact and you can scale up. So I think there. I agree. I agree. Um, Excellent, and you guys probably, your minds are already Twitter, Facebook, you know, everybody, you can, you go, go out and find the money there. <laughs> but it's, um, not, it's not obviously just cash, is it? And the, uh, the, resources are, are important, resources. but it's something more than that, isn't it? it? Yeah. The other thing I wanted to mention was yes. what else is going on. Mm -hmm. there, there is a science and art to scaling up, and that's something that really interests me. Yep. The World Health Organization has a whole area called ExtendNet. I recommend that everybody look at the criteria for setting the stage so that you can scale up. I personally am not interested in doing anything that can't be scaled up really big. I'm working in China now with factory workers, and there the challenges have been put to me by the national government to scale up the current program to 100 million workers. No. So they said, we're not interested in small programs. You know, you can just go home. So I think um, some of those criteria that you can see on ExtendNet, having a champion, doing really deep participatory design, just we've been talking about here, I think those are things that are worth looking at, plus these really creative partnerships. There's tons of money floating around that people don't know what to do with, and they want to make a difference. And they want to express social responsibility. They do. Yeah. Last word to the poets. Well, thank you guys for having us. Uh, just, you know, there is one free resource that's available literally in all of our pockets that all of us could use to promote our efforts, which is social media. Um, we garnered over 15,000 views in one day by one of our videos, The Product of His Environment, uh, being showcased on Upworthy. We've had two videos showcased on Upworthy and a third on the way. It's one of those gatekeeper kind of video platform introduce, introductory sites like Gawker or anything like that that immediately generates views and, and engages an entirely new audience that we would, for a California state-specific program, would otherwise not have. Um, and it kind of levels the playing field and also opens up the ground for a lot of collaborations. We've had, by way of Twitter and Facebook, we've been reached out to by a lot of uh, former diabetics who have created their own local mom and pop organic food distribution companies throughout California. Uh, we've reached out to other young people and other storytelling organizations. And you know, to the, to the point of collaboration, this project in and of itself is a collaboration between UCSF Center for Vulnerable Populations, and Youth Speaks, which is a literary organization. I mean, it's apples and oranges by definition. Like, the fact that Dean was in the room with Sarah and myself, in the two-hour workshops, the first hour was Dean's literally schooling us about what is type 2 diabetes, what is a Lancet, how do you measure sugar levels. He measured all of our sugar levels in our first workshop. To have a doctor in our writing workshop writing poems alongside of us, and there is you know, that's another side note. Uh, but, yeah, you might actually soon. Uh, but, Emmy Award winning. Emmy Award winning. But, you know, it, it's the nature of collaboration. Like, this, this project in its, of itself is a collaboration. You know what I mean? Um, I work with you speaks on another collaboration called the Off Page Project, which is a collaboration with the Center for Investigative Reporting. So, there's a lot of ways that collaboration can inherently strengthen projects, and there's a lot of ways that we can use our digital landscape to broaden that audience. So I thought, I thought it was almost certainly that the young poets would say something 
Just exactly Digital. like what you said. So Digital. thank you very much. So at this point, let's take uh, 15 minutes for a break and come back at about 10 minutes past the hour. Thank you very much to this panel.